Hello and welcome to an exciting journey through the eyes of Marvin and Bernard Kalb, two of the most respected broadcast journalists of our time. Over a period of 70 years, these two brothers reported some of the world's most historic events and witnessed firsthand some of our nation's most turbulent moments. Marvin Kalb was a diplomatic correspondent for CBS and NBC News for 30 years. In the 1980s, he anchored Meet the Press. He also anchored the Kalb Report, a quarterly broadcast from the National Press Club, emphasizing journalistic ethics and practice. He has authored and co-authored 14 books, including his most recent, The Road to War, Presidential Commitments Honored and Betrayed. Today, Marvin Kalb is a senior advisor to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is a professor of journalism at Harvard University. Bernard Kalb started as a reporter and columnist for the New York Times before he branched out into TV journalism at CBS and NBC News. He was a foreign correspondent for 15 years covering Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Bernard Kalb's career as a journalist took him to locations around the world, including Washington, Moscow, Beijing, Saigon, Paris, Antarctica, and many places in between. These two brothers have some wonderful stories to tell that will be both entertaining and educational. So sit back and prepare to take a journalistic journey as the Johns Hopkins Osher School of Lifelong Learning and Montgomery College's TV and radio students proudly present The Brothers Calb, Here, There, and Everywhere, a lecture series that recounts the globe-trotting professional experiences of Marvin and Bernard Calb. CBS News diplomatic correspondent Marvin Calb. The Pope slumped, hit by two bullets. reduces the risk of war. Do you agree or disagree? Probably the, for the last time. Marvin Cal, CBS News. Scholars, if the scholars will come to water, uh, we'll pick up this conversation. But I ought to confess something because you see this mystery guest here. Uh, my brother Marvin, in an unforgivable fraternal betrayal, <laughs> has decided that to give a higher priority just for this Wednesday to do something he has to do as a professor at Harvard, to go back to Cambridge and mystify the students there or something or other. <laughs> and so there was a big blank spot on this chair. And I wondered who would be at least triply worthy of Marvin. And luckily, I inherited somebody here who feels like one of the cowboys. I, f I give my good friend here, Frank Sesno. You, you should know that it's been my very good fortune over the years, beginning in 1969, when I was uh, Southeast Asian Bureau Chief for ABC. And I was based in Hong Kong, and my counterpart over at CBS in those days was Bernie. And then in 1971, when I came back from, from Vietnam and became diplomatic correspondent for ABC, my, my counterpart at CBS was Marvin. <laughs> and so over the years, I have been sort of a poor man's cow. <laughs> And, and have long considered myself to be a younger brother. And in fact, the only reason I come out on events like this at the request of, of my old friend Bernie is because how often does a guy in his 70s get a chance to feel really young? <laughs> OK, so we all know what the subject is today, China. And among the 70-odd reporters who accompanied Nixon in 1972 on that trip to China, 41 years ago, 41, you must have been five at the time. <laughs> 41 years ago on the trip to China, 70 of us trailing the president for five or six days in China. He arrived there February 22nd. But when the president, in the summer of 71, stunned everybody by saying on a broadcast, 
asking for time, that he would be visiting China, the old red beta himself, the anti-communist, the fiercely anti-communist Richard Nixon, that he was going into the land of communism. It was a stunning development. And as a result, reporters all during that period from Nixon's first speech, here I come China, to the actual visit on February 22nd in 1972, reporters and hundreds of others tried to do something to get some story in advance of Nixon actually landing in China. So the great journalistic scramble was on. Did you, do you remember any sort of mischief you were up to at that particular period prior to our getting on the press plane? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it wasn't really mischief, and it went back to, I mean, first of all, you have to remember what was going on in China at the time, in 1972. And we were really unaware of the fact that the Cultural Revolution, which we thought had pretty much petered out, was still in full swing. So China was, in many respects, just as closed a society in 1972 as it had been in the years immediately prior to that. Just to give you a quick sense of how we covered China in those days, I mean, in terms of contacts, uh, you know, we would be talking to refugees, we'd be talking to academics. We'd in be Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. Uh, and we would drive out, those of us in television who needed some kinds of pictures to go with whatever little nuggets of information we could dig up, we would drive out to the new territories as close to the Chinese border as we could get. And there we would set up a huge antenna. And in the back of my cameraman's car, we would have a television set, a small black and white television set, which was hooked into the car battery and attached to the antenna. And through that antenna, we would pull in the signal of Guangdong Canton television. And we would be able thereby to get the evening news on Canton television. And occasionally there would be some pieces of video that we would be able to use. But that's how, that's how desperate we were just to get any pictures inside China. So I, I tell you that story really as a preamble to what you're going to see and what Bernie and I will be talking about because that opening to China. And I see that there is no one above the age of 40 here, so I'll have to remind you. <laughs> That opening to China was the equivalent, as one of our colleagues, I think, put it at the time, uh, as seeing the other side of the moon. Mm. We had seen none of it. True. And when Koppel would do these pieces with China as a backdrop along the Hong Kong Chinese border, I would occasionally get a rocket from CBS in New York. They, having seen ABC, would say, Calb. Koppel reporting so-and-so from Chinese border. And I usually answer it, pay no attention to it. He's, ungr <laughs> he's ungrammatical. <laughs> and I would escape. I'll tell you a little bit about what I try to do to get a visa between that blank period of Nixon's announcement, I'm going to China, to the actual takeoff of the plane on February 22nd from Washington, D.C. The Wong slide, just the Wong slide. I lived many years, about five, in Indonesia. And at that particular, we're talking late 50s, early 60s. And at that time, uh, of course, the United States, having shunned China, there was absolutely no relations between US and China. But we all tried wherever we were to get a visa. This gentleman here, Wang Zhen, is a very famous Chinese general. He was the Chinese ambassador to Indonesia. And when I would go to a diplomatic reception, for example, with President Sukarno, I would always approach him, and he would always flee. <laughs> I would move in his direction. It became a bit of a tango. I would go in his direction. He would turn around because there was forbidden contact. As a matter of fact, when the US ambassador in Warsaw, prior to the visit, was ordered by the White House to cozy up, bad word, to get close to the Chinese ambassador as soon as he can to hint that President Nixon was interested in going to China 
Stessel, Walter Stessel, the ambassador, refused to take the order because he thought it was out of bounds. And he was called back and Nixon told him directly, you will do this. And so at a reception, at a fashion show at the Yugoslav embassy. <laughs> this, is, this is true, look it up. That's, that's an oxymoron right there. Right? <laughs> Stessel starts to move toward the Chinese ambassador who sees Stessel. They weren't sure, as a matter of fact, at the American embassy, whether he was the Mongolian ambassador or the Vietnamese ambassador, there was a certain facial uncertainty. And he was approaching him saying, the American wants to, and he fled. And they could never make any contact. But never mind, between my being turned away by uh, Ambassador Huang Zhen, I tried once again. This is after Nixon announced the visit. I met my office at Washington CBS. New York says, come on up. We're about to, the, 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 we had then recognized China, admit, voted for it to come into the United Nations. Taiwan, we broke relations with Taiwan. And the question was, what can you do to get some good story after the announcement of the Nixon visit and prior to the actual visit? Let's do something on China. So my vice president, Gordon Manning, said, you have any ideas? I said, well, I'll tell you what I would do. I would go to Paris. We knew the routing of the Chinese delegation en route to the United Nations. This was November 1971. I would go to Paris and try to get on the same plane with the Chinese delegation, Paris, New York, and try to interview them on the plane. Can you guarantee it? No. But I have done this in Asia, and it usually, ha usually has worked. There's nothing like a camera to flatter a diplomat. Can you go tonight? I said, yes. And I, as I recall, Phyllis set up my clothing and my passport. Walter Cronkite will go with you. And, the, and Gordon Manning went. And that night, we flew to Paris, waiting for the Chinese delegation. We go to the airport. We knew the itinerary and get on the plane with them. As it happened, Wang Chen, by now, had become the Chinese ambassador to Paris. Since I did not know him, you might say, and since he rebuffed me year after year, I took a chance and dictated a letter and in Paris, dear Mr. Ambassador, blah, 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 Walter Cronkite, blah, 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 and the UN and so forth. We'd love to get an interview about the Chinese position on A, B, C, and D. No answer. We got on the plane and took our seats. We're sitting first class. Wang Hua and Zhao Guanhua had the first two seats on the left. We were four or five rows. Once we were in the air, there was no escape. <laughs> Gordon Manning gave me a little push. He said, uh, go to it. So I went to it. I got, I'm wired up, but I'll give you an idea. I walked down the three or four rows, and then I turned around, and I said, what a surprise! <laughs> to see you here. <laughs> and I said, you know, we've met before, Mr. Zhao Guanhua, Mr. Huang Hua, uh, blah, 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 blah. And uh, three rows behind me is Walter Cronkite, the most trusted journalism, pardon me, the most trusted journalism, <laughs> most trusted journalist, uh, journalist in America. And we are on the plane for one reason, only to interview you two to give us some advance idea. In television, this is theater. Uh, to give, you some idea, give us some idea of what the Chinese will be doing at the UN because there's been a new breakthrough on relations between China and the United States. So they, they, thought, about it, they thought about it. Then I got away from one of the delegates uh, on the, the Chinese team and they said, okay. And you remember in the old 707 couple there were that little lounge up front? We took those four seats. These two gentlemen here, Cronkite and I there, and they lay down only one stipulation. No audio. You could take pictures, but no audio. And at one point, I took out my notebook, careful reporter that I am, and began to jot down a few of their immortal phrases. And Walter gave me a budge in the arm. And he said, put it away, put it away. And the theory that my notebook might terrorize them. We talked for, what, 15, 20 minutes, went back, scribbled the notes. And so when we got off the plane, although there were many reporters and correspondents at Idlewild waiting for the Chinese delegation, we had those first pictures. As I say in television, this is a fantastic scoop. But, uh, and CBS, in fact, had a, had a report that night on the air, which I have here, but I'm not allowed to show because for some idiotic reason it's copyrighted.
but we talked there, and then we did what we had to do, and then, then we were suddenly on our way to China. What I want to do is show a few minutes of the China trip to give you some feel of it. And this is from the point of view of journalists. The frustration, the excitement, the drama. We were en route to Mars or somewhere. It was, Coppola has indicated we lived for years on the edge of China. He would be interviewing, I'm sure you did, people to find out whether the, the rails on Chinese railroads were getting thin. That would introduce, in the, the rails, the steel was getting thin. You could write a story about the coming economic disaster <laughs> in China. You'd interview, as you say, refugees, anybody you could to get some portrait of inner China that we as American reporters were denied. Those are the lengths we went to. So many Americans, when they thought of Mao, they thought of mayonnaise. They, the, <laughs> the idea was to distinguish between uh, the two Chinas. And that was the dilemma that took place from the time China took over, communist China took over in 1949, until a recognition of what factors. What, for example, Koppel, what were the factors that drove Nixon and Kissinger to start to turn the dial on the possibility of a relationship? Well, prim Russia. Prim primarily to put pressure on the Soviets. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, there was the, the counterbalancing. But let me, just, let me just underline what Bernie has been telling you. Uh, by giving you one piece of information little known, I'm not even sure if you know it, there was a guy at the, at the US consulate in Hong Kong who was known as the Caliper Man. You familiar with mm -hmm. the Caliper Man? Now, you all remember from uh, you know, geometry classes, the Caliper, right? The Caliper Man uh, at, the, at the US consulate would measure the distance between the mole on Mao's lower lip and the edge of his lower lip. Now, the reason they would do that is they were convinced that Mao had any number of doubles. And I would periodically be awakened at 3 in the morning, as I'm sure Bernie was, by some idiot on the desk in New York saying, the Hong Kong star reports that Mao is dead. Now, the Hong Kong star does not quite rise to the level of our tabloid newspapers. <laughs> the Hong Kong star is sort of the equivalent of the old National Enquirer. But when the Hong Kong star was quoted by UPI or Associated Press, the, the editors in New York would go crazy and they'd say, wake Coppola up. And I'd say, what the hell do you expect me to do? It's 3 o'clock in the morning here. Right? Well, check it out. So I would, I would call the consulate and wake up the duty officer, and we would try to find out. And, and eventually, the word would come back. I mean, they didn't. I, I had one good contact at the, at the consulate who would say, Caliper Man says no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, his, the Caliper Man says, it's, you know, it's definitely Mao. He's still alive. Don't worry about it. Go back to bed. But that's how desperate we were. Yeah, that's quite true. Hard to think of that once upon a time when you recognize that millions of Americans have gone to China since that opening of the presidents in 1972. I was doing a piece on, on photo reconnaissance. And I was out at CIA headquarters in Langley talking to the guy who was the chief photo reconnaissance expert for the CIA. And he said, you were in, in China in 72, weren't you, when Nixon got there? And I said, yeah. He said, you remember the scene at Tiananmen? And I said, of course. Now, there are, if, if you looked at that picture carefully, there were a few hundred people. What the CIA discovered in doing photo analysis was that there were actually probably a couple of thousand people who were walking around the block. So the Chinese had so thoroughly sanitized Tiananmen that there were 2,000 people there, but they knew who every one of them was. And they just kept walking in circles around Tiananmen Square. 
And to the untrained eye, to us, it just looked as though, yeah, there were a few people out there, but they showed absolutely no interest in the motorcade, and the reason was they had all been pre-chosen, pre-selected, pre-sanitized, and there really was no Chinese crowd there. You remember Senator McCarthy who would say, I have here in my hand? Yeah. I have here in my hand a transcript of what took place in that hour that Mao met Nixon. And it contains these priceless gems. Uh, about three seconds into it, Dr. Kissinger says to Chairman Mao, I used to assign the chairman collective writings to my classes at Harvard. Chairman Mao says, those writings of mine aren't anything. There's nothing instructive in what I wrote. And then he talks about how the president worked out the plan for the visit to China. It was the president who set the direction and worked out the plan, says Kissinger. Nixon, he's a very wise assistant to say that. Mao, he is praising you, saying you are clever in doing so. Nixon, he doesn't look like a secret agent. He's the only man in captivity who could go to Paris 12 times and peeking once and no one knew it except possibly a couple of pretty girls. Joe laughs. Kissinger, they didn't know it. I used it as a cover. Mao, in Paris? Nixon, anyone who uses pretty girls as a cover must be the greatest diplomat of all time. And so you have a sense of the weightiness of the issues. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that, uh, this, this was kind of show and show, not even show and tell. This, these things were declassified later, and I got them for your entertainment. They did, however, bring up the Soviet, uh, what they both perceived as a Soviet threat. And Nixon says at one point, he says, we'd like to talk about Taiwan, Vietnam, Korea. And then he says, Nixon, well, we, for example, must ask ourselves, again, in the confines of this room, but that's 42 years later, but this is off the record, uh, in the confines of this room, why the Soviets have more forces on the border facing you than on the border facing Western Europe? So, as Koppel said a moment ago, the driving impetus for the Nixon visit was the Soviet Union. How to play the Chinese card against the Soviets, and from the Chinese point of view, was how to play the American card against the Soviets. Uh, the old saying is the diplomats say, we have no permanent friends, we have no permanent enemies, we only have permanent interests. And in that spirit, they overcame or shackled their, how shall I say, lack of affection for communism with the idea of building up some sort of wall to keep the Soviet Union on notice that they cannot take China for granted. Uh, you remember it began with ping pong, they mentioned that, and they mentioned the handshake. For example, uh, Nixon says at one point, uh, Joe says, what, what was the reason for the difficulty between us? And Prime Minister Joe says, the main thing was John Foster Dulles's policy. And Mao says, he, Joe, also discussed this with Kissinger. And then Nixon says, but they, uh, gesturing to a Joe and Kissinger, shook hands. So that even in this thing where every moment was critical, Mao didn't, and Joe never forgot that snub of 1954. And this is now 72. But uh, you could go this thing, it, it turns up online. And then at one point, just to wrap it up here, to debrief, Chairman Mao says at one point, toward the end, to Mr. Nixon, your book, The Six Crises, is not a bad book. <laughs> and Nixon says, he, Mao, reads too much. <laughs> and then it says, there were some closing pleasantries. Chairman said he was not well. He was to die four years later in 76. He was not well. Nixon re responded that he looked good, good diplomacy. The chairman, <laughs> chairman said that appearances were deceiving. After handshakes and more pictures, Prime Minister Joe then escorted the president out of the residence. Now, of course, with the meeting taking place so quickly, remember how astonished we were that it took place within an hour? They had a meeting? That was it. <laughs> it was the stamp of approval of Chairman Mao on the visit. Got the word out to the Chinese, this visit is okay, it's been authorized, and that's why they're here. I'm not prepared to give you any additional information. <laughs> yes, I know. How did because, that go over? Because it was so 
I mean, what they discussed was just so extraordinarily important. Yes. Right? <laughs> that we couldn't possibly share Kissinger's that. Kissinger's classes at Harvard, Nixon's six crises and exactly. so forth. Yeah. And it was like that all the way. It was, a, it was an exercise in being driven mad where you, ha where you had to interpret body language in a syllable or two you might pick up to extrapolate from all that a four or five hundred word story. The astonishing thing is that reporters did get that story very well. Because although there were only about 70, 70 reporters went, and I've got to interrupt a second again, to tell you about this list that Nixon had. There was a, a list which I tried to find last night. It's somewhere in my havoc at home. Uh, there's a list of Nixon carefully going through every single name of the reporters and crossing out people he didn't like or newspapers he didn't like. It may be in this thing here with Stanley Carno of the Washington Post. Um, there may be a segment that, that I kept in which, next to Stanley's name, it says, under no circumstances. <laughs> Stanley won, of course. Under no circumstances, because the Washington Post was then beginning to discover Watergate. That was one reason. And secondly, because Stanley was a real China expert, and he wanted sports writers. Like he has a great, very good, uh, next to Bob Considine, who's a famous sports columnist, it says, excellent. Uh, because that was the quality he would have preferred, because from the outset, to the White House and the administration, this was a spectacular, uh, what is it, extravaganza, a television extravaganza. And they were concerned about television cameras and Max Frankel, who got a Pulitzer Prize for the Times on his coverage of that. Uh, that was secondary and uh, possibly even an irritant to Nixon because he wanted none of that. So let's see, what did we say it is now? 40, 40, 41 40, years ago. 41 years ago, more than 41 years ago. It was on this occasion that I committed an act of minor larceny. Oh, yeah, you, it, wait a minute. Guesses. Who said it? Who said it? Who, you said it? No, no, no. no. You get there it. Were, Two I, months free in China. There were. <laughs> President Nixon had been using a pair of wooden, plain wooden chopsticks. And as everybody left the Great Hall, I noticed that those chopsticks were still lying on his plate. I didn't think anyone was going to use them again. So they, they now hang on my wall in Potomac. Hold it. If you go to Google and ask about another destination for the President Chopsticks, you will read a confession by John Burns of the Times now, but at the time was with the Toronto Globe and Star. And he tells the story about how he looked at the chopsticks. And uh, I don't know whose chopstick has the Tony, but. Uh, he took the chopsticks, and he said, <laughs> he, didn't th he, didn't, he thought about uh, what you're talking about, the moral challenge, and uh, he said, who else would use the chopsticks? And in fact, there was a report that he, he says in this article that he was offered $25,000 for Nixon's chopsticks, but he didn't want to make a profit of it, and subsequently donated it to some sort of organization, probably to your wall. <laughs> I, I suggest, I'm sure somewhere we can get some of Nixon's DNA. <laughs> Nixon's what? Nixon's, what was that last word you used? DNA. Nixon's DNA. I personally think this is what happened. <laughs> Having no respect for the talents of larceny among the American press, the minute one pair of, <laughs> one pair of chopsticks was scooped up, they put another pair. <laughs> And I know at least 45 reporters, maybe 50, with chopsticks on the wall. How many, how many banquets did they have? They had more than one banquet, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's entirely possible that John got yep, one set and I got the other set. But right. Anyway. I have to tell you the Great Wall story Is this another at this confession? point. Huh? <laughs> No, this, this is... Uh, We're coming to the Great Wall eventually. 
Yeah, but this is, I mean, when you see, Nixon was one of the smartest politicians I ever met. But when it came to making small talk, he was pathetic. <laughs> and when he was taken out to the Great Wall, Tom Jarrell, whom you saw a couple of minutes ago there, was the ABC uh, White House correspondent. He was the pool reporter on the Great Wall with Nixon. And he shoved the microphone in Nixon's face and he said, Mr. President, what do you think of the Great Wall? Now, you might think that someone at the White House had anticipated that question. <laughs> but no, um, and, and Nixon's response was classic. He said, whoa, well, <laughs> one can only say, upon looking at this wall, that this is truly a great wall. You should Smart. hear Nixon's Smart. impersonation of Capo. <laughs> now, on the, on the flight from Beijing to Shanghai, I was struggling with the notion of what the president could have said. And, and so I wrote a little song, which in my fevered imagination, I had the president of the United States singing to the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party. And the song goes something like this. In fact, it goes exactly like this. <laughs> It's a grand old wall. <laughs> it's a long-standing wall, wins the prize for its size and its age. It gave just rewards to the Mongol hordes, <laughs> drove the kulaks away in a rage. From Beijing to the seas, it has saved the Chinese till the days of the Guomindang. From Ming to Han, and on and on. <laughs> With the Great Wall, you can't go wrong. Bravo! They, they don't want substance, Bernie. <laughs>
Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.